Yes, I spent 18 years researching the issue of water fluoridation at the behest of my wife. She twisted my arm. Uh, as you've heard, I was specializing in environmental chemistry and toxicology at St. Lawrence. And now I'm the director of the Fluoride Action Network. Uh, this research culminated in the publication of this book, The Case Against Fluoride, in 2010. And uh, I would like to particularly draw attention to my co-authors, who I think really dramatically improved the quality of this text over and above my initial draft. James Beck, MD, PhD from Calgary, and Speddy Micklem, a doctor, he got his doctorate from Oxford and was a biologist at the Us University of Edinburgh. So three of us, three retired professors, one in chemistry, one in physics, one in biology, had a plenty of time to review the literature. And every single argument in this book has been referenced to the scientific literature, 80 pages in all. I urge you to, to use this, to, to read this. I've only got 20 minutes today, which is much shorter than I normally have, but much of the evidence you'll find uh, in, this, in this book. Now, one of the things which really struck me uh, 18 years ago was how low the level was of fluoride in mother's milk, extremely low. 0 0.004 parts per million, which means that a bottle-fed baby in a fluoridated community is getting about 200 times the level of fluoride that nature intended. In my view, that's a reckless thing to do. The assumption that nature does not know what the baby needs, uh, both for effectiveness of any kind, uh, what is needed, and what may harm it, uh, is to me preposterous. A key question that has never been thoroughly addressed and certainly was not addressed when the US government uh, in the form of the Public Health Service endorsed fluoridation in, in 1950, they knew that there would be an increase in dental fluorosis. They expected 10% of the population to get dental fluorosis drinking fluoridated water. What they probably didn't know is that uh, in, by 2010, 41% of American children age 12 to 15 would have this condition. But the question that was not thoroughly addressed scientifically is what other tissues were being impacted when the biochemistry of the growing tooth cell was impacted? Uh, could fluoride toxicity be confined only to the tooth? I think that's an unlikely proposition for what we know about biochemistry. But today, the evidence is coming in. There's extensive evidence that fluoride damages the brains of animals and humans. Uh, we are talking about a large body, body of literature, which is consistent. Uh, over 40 animal studies shows that fluoride can damage the brain after long, prolonged exposure. 19 animal studies shows that fluoride can interfere with the learning and memory of mice and rats. Uh, 12 studies link fluoride with neurobehavioral uh, deficits. Uh, three human studies indicate that fluoride can impact the fetal development of the brain, and for that matter, the bone. And 37 out of 43 published studies on IQ have shown an association uh, uh, that high fluoride exposure lowers IQ. To access any of these brain studies, you can go to our webpage fluoridealert.org, forward slash issues, forward slash health, forward slash, and then you can put brain in, but you've got an option now. You can put 14 different tissues in and you'll get the full literature uh, that we've made available on the internet on all these different tissues. But the one in question here is the brain. So all the studies I'm talking about are all there. You can access them uh, in detail. Now, one of the studies that particularly intrigued me uh, was the study by Zhang, because I was act actually was able to go to China and, and see the two villages where the study was conducted. One village had natural levels of fluoride in their well water, less than 0.7, and the other village had 2.5 to 4.5 parts per million fluoride. And eyeballing those villages, when I went to those villages, everything looked the same. I mean, this is not strictly science, but everything looked the same. The same occupation, rural farmers, the same schooling, the same diet, um, the same everything you could think of, same housing. Um, 
But the big difference was the level of fluoride in the drinking water. But Zhang also controlled for lead and he controlled for iodine. One of the accusations from Broadbent is we did not control for lead and here was a case where they did control for lead. And since this study was published, we've also found out there was no difference in the arsenic levels. What they found is a drop of five to 10 IQ points between these two villages and a whole shift of the IQ curve for both females and males. This is the shift from males. The, the dark blue line is the low fluoride village and the magenta line is the, is the high fluoride village. So you see the whole shift of that IQ curve over, meaning fewer very bright children and more mentally handicapped children. More about that later. Now fortunately for us, this wasn't just the studies that that Fan uh, was able to translate and find in the literature, sometimes obscure Chinese literature. But this now has been updated and, and uh, well, updated by a team from Harvard University, which included Philip, Philippe Grandjean, who's one of the world's great epidemiologists, who brought to the attention the effect of mercury on the developing fetus, uh, his famous study in the Faroe Islands on fish eating a population. So a very important uh, uh, study then by this team from Harvard. And they did a meta-analysis of 27 studies and they could do a meta-analysis because they all had the same methodology, comparing the IQ of children in a high fluoride village and with the children in a low fluoride village. In two of the studies that high fluoride was due to coal burning, but in 25 of the 27 studies it was due to fluoride in the water. This study was published in Environmental Health Perspectives, which is one of the most important environmental health journals in the world. And in the importance of this also is that that is published by the National Institute of Environmental Health Studies in the United States, which is part of the NIH. It's the part, if you like, of the equivalent of your Ministry of Health. So on the one hand, the NIH is promoting fluoridation, and on the other hand, they have published this review which says it might be damaging children's brains. Now the Harvard team acknowledged what everybody else has acknowledged, that there are weaknesses in, this study, in these studies. We need more information than the many of these studies uh, provide. However, what they also acknowledge is that the results are remarkably consistent remarkably consistent, even though they're taken from all different parts of China, taken from Iran, uh, taken from Mexico, taken from India, so different, different locations, and yet 26 out of the 27 studies that were in this meta-analysis showed that the high fluoride village had less the lowered IQ. And the average drop was quite substantial. Seven IQ points is substantial, and you'll see why that I say that a little bit later. Now the promoters of fluoridation, including Broadbent, uh, Dr. Broadbent from Otago University, have made and continue to make this false claim that, uh, or this, yes, the false claim that we can ignore these studies because they were all done at high concentrations. They even use the words very high concentrations. But this is just not true. And nine of those studies, nine, were conducted at the high fluoride village was less than three parts per million. That's not high when your job is to protect the whole population of a country like New Zealand. Now, I want to show you some spin from the NFIS. Um, they say there is some evidence suggesting a possibility of slight adverse effects. They are calling a drop of seven IQ points a slight adverse effect. Um, high drinking water concentrations, but no give it good evidence of effects at concentrations found in New Zealand fluoridated water. They go on, again stressing high drinking water fluoride concentrations. They are not very relevant to the New Zealand situation. Due to the inconsistent results, I've told you, the results are remarkably consistent. So a little bit of spin here from NFIS. And here is from Michael Beasley, who's an advisor to the NFIS. Again, he says, the high levels in the Chinese IQ studies 
are generally much higher than those occurring in New Zealand, where the water is the range is 0.7 to 1.2 and increasingly going down to 0.7 to 1.0. That change by incidentally would be totally irrelevant to what the issue we're talking about here. But again, much higher. Now, first thing to say is this, when you comparing concentrations, when you're dealing with a situation like fluoride, where once you put in the water you cannot control the dose, is sloppy. It suggests that these people have no idea of toxicology, because the first lesson is the difference in concentration and dose. The dose depends on how much water you drink. So if you had water at one part per million, you drank one liter, you would get one milligram per day. That's the dose. If you drank two liters at one milligram per liter, you would get two milligrams. Three liters, three milligrams. Four liters, four milligrams. This means that it is quite possible that a child drinking water at one part per million could get higher doses than some of these children in China drinking water at say three parts per million, or as we see in a moment, even less than that. So it's very, very sloppy uh, uh, an analysis just to dismiss these findings on the basis of the difference between the concentration used in New Zealand and the concentration in these studies. What is needed is a margin of safety analysis. And I'm going to do that now. I'm going to do a quick and dirty uh, margin of safety analysis for lower IQ, a risk assessment, if you like. Now, the task here, our overall goal, is to find what we call the no observable adverse effect level. And when you're sure that you've got such a level, we then, in toxicology, in regulatory toxicology, is to divide that number by 10 in order to protect the whole population, to get a safe level that we are convinced means that any child drinking this uh, or getting this dose would be safe. Now, I know it's conservative, but you have to be conservative if you're exposing a whole population to a substance which you suspect of being toxic and having effects. So now the effect has been demonstrated, we've got to make sure there's an adequate margin of safety. So our starting point in this quick and dirty risk assessment is five statistically significant studies where the high fluoride village contained 1.8, 2, 2.3, 8, 2.5, and 2.9 parts per million fluoride in the water. This is what Broadbent says is very high. This is what the NFIS says is very high. All right, there are the five studies in question. Three from China, two from Iran. We will select the study with the lowest concentration that caused harm. And in this case, it's 1.8 parts per million. Now, the first step that we have to do is to estimate doses, because we don't have the doses, we only have the concentration. And so a reasonable, I'm going to estimate a reasonable range of doses. Let's assume that the children are drinking, those children who drank a half a litre of water a day will be getting a dose of 0.9 milligrams per day. That's 1.8 milligrams per litre times a half a litre gives you a dose of 0.9 milligrams per day. Okay? Now, if the child drank one litre of water a day, the dose would be 1.8 milligrams per day. 1.8 milligrams per liter times one liter is 1.8 milligrams per day. And if the child drank two liters of water a day, the dose would be 3.6 milligrams per day. The range then 0.9 to 3.6 milligrams per day. Again, we have to start with the lowest level, which we assume could cause harm, and that is 0.9 milligrams per day. That's what we would call the lowest observable adverse effect level. But what we want is the no observable adverse effect level. But we don't have that. None of these data has told us where there was no effect. So what do we have to do under those circumstances? It's very clear cut. You divide the low L by 10 to get to the no L the no observable adverse effect level. So that would be 0 0.09, 0 0.9 divided by 10. 
Now we have to apply the safety margin to protect the whole population. So we we're now taking the Noel and divide that by 10, and that gives us a safe dose now, 0 0.009 milligrams per day. What we're saying here is based upon that study and applying the standard safety factors, we wouldn't want a New Zealand child, any child in New Zealand, which would include the most sensitive child, maybe he's already compromised, the most sensitive child would not, you wouldn't want them to get more than 0 0.009 milligrams per day to make sure that their IQs were not lowered. Now, that, um, so the safe dose then is 0 0.009 milligrams per day. In terms of how much water that is, it would be nine milliliters. That's less than two teaspoons. A teaspoon, a five milliliter teaspoon, less than two teaspoons of water. You would not want a child in New Zealand drinking more than two teaspoonfuls to be absolutely certain that you're gonna protect them against this lowering IQ effect of fluoride. Now, that would rule out, that would rule out uh, fluoridation right there. Rule it out. Now, let's stop being so conservative. Let's take out one of the factors of 10, okay? That means no child should drink 90 milliliters of water. That's half a glass. Let's be even, even less conservative and take out a, another factor of 10. Now you wouldn't want the child to drink more than 900 milliliters. That's less than a liter of water, less than a quart of water. So whichever way you look at it, once this, these IQs have been lowered at these levels, if the science is valid, and of course they are saying it's not, but if it's valid, then fluoridation should end as a matter of priority. Incidentally, I've also done calculations for babies, and I can tell you that a breastfed baby, based upon these same numbers, would be safe to drink mother's milk at 0 0.004 parts per million. But a bottle-fed baby in New Zealand will get between 180 and 300 times the level, the safe dose, as far as protecting against IQ. So I think, based upon these studies that are now emerging, that Mother Nature was really great that she determined that the newborn baby should not get much fluoride. We were lucky, or, we, or those, or rather the non-fluoridated countries were lucky in their judgment. Now in terms of seeing the bigger picture here, Philip Grandjean, who's written a book about the subject called Only One Chance, wrote the following. He said, fluoride seems to fit in with lead, mercury, and other poisons that cause chemical brain drain. The effect of each toxicant may seem small, but the combined damage on a population scale can be serious, especially because the brain power of the next generation is crucial to all of us. And I'd like to explain what he means by this. Um, this is the normal distribution of IQ. It's the standard bell-shaped curve, thank you. The average child would have an average uh, IQ of 100. But the green area there is the fraction of the population that is above uh, 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 genius. They're very bright, the geniuses and the magenta area is mentally handicapped. If we were to shift the whole IQ curve over by five IQ points, you wouldn't notice much of a difference for the most of the people in the population between 100 and 95. But look what happens to the tails. If you were to do that, you would halve the number of geniuses in your society and you would double the number of mentally handicapped. I can't underline how serious this is. Any time, we have red flags being waved on a substance having the potential to do that shift. We should take every step possible to avoid exposure. And if in the case, in this case, we're exposing the whole population, this becomes even more important, exposing the whole population. And finally, if you're doing something 
for which it's been demonstrated all over the world, and especially in Europe, that there are alternative methods of achieving the same end, it is absolutely irresponsible for health authorities to continue to push this outdated practice on a population like New Zealand. It's time to bring it an end. It's time to put dentistry back in the dental office and let us drink water without this contamination. Thank you very much.